So that's not me. That's Stan. I'm pointing at Stan. <laughs> no, he's doing all the work. He's doing you're everything. You're supposed to just claim it's you. I'm not Jason. claiming because everyone knows I I am not they locatable during the week. I am <sighs> dealing with you know Chinese importers and no. They they want to feel like they're talking Dominican to you, Jason. Sausage makers. It's Jason. <laughs> it's just not me. I'm not. I don't even know his his Twitter handle. Joint ventures everywhere. Yes. <laughs> Taking over the planet. You said world ventures. Joint ventures. Wake up now. Is that what it is now, Jason? Wake up now. It's a joke with you. Uh, oh, you you caught me on another level. So definitely you can follow me there, and uh, I'm always happy to be on the show so i'm going to pass along to uh, our counselor over here yeah, thank you thank you so uh, my name is Alyssa fuchs and you can find me on twitter at Alyssa fuchs which is i-l-y-s-s-a or you can get at me on the fan page which is facebook.com slash politically preposterous where we will be taking your comments throughout right. the show and also, if you want to chime in, you can tweet us at BeHeard underscore radio. You can also like us on Facebook as well at Facebook.com slash Let Your Voice Be Heard. And, of course, if you want to see us in on Instagram, follow Trey us Flexin. at BeHeard underscore radio. I, I was waiting for you to chime in. I don't want to see you, Selena. Yes, I don't want to see you. I think, I think people want to see I'm us. I'm going to see you guys. Jason, Alyssa, uh, what? I see you guys. Anyway. Anyways, Alyssa. Speaking of seeing things. Okay, so we have a great show lined up. We're starting a show speaking about corporate tax policy reform and the loopholes. So tax day is coming up next week, April 15th. But you know who won't be paying taxes? A lot of major corporations that bring in billions of dollars in profits. And you know what they do? They store it overseas so that they don't have to pay taxes on it. But what is I feel like what is the theme for our society right now? It's all about investing in America, bringing things back. But what about your tax dollars? They're purposely storing it in offshore accounts so they don't have to pay anything. Well, Selena, I think you're missing the point. Point, that's so what <laughs> I think that's a very important point and also why should I have to give my millions of dollars that I used tax dollars to get and then redistribute it to the people who are poor <laughs> <laughs> I think that if poor people just got jobs, then we wouldn't have this problem. Well, you know, and lazy. I think that if the corporations actually paid the taxes, then we would have more money in the budget and our deficit would go down and we'd be able to do more things and we would actually be able to spend money on things instead of having an austerity program. That is what I call liberal craziness. Mm -hmm. I think that you need to start letting corporations pray at church and not allow gay people to work for them or come into their stores. And that's when we'll have a good America. Jason. And I, I am <laughs> listening inside to all of this right now. I mean, it's going to be a heck of a conversation. You guys know I'm, I'm always the devil's advocate when it comes to corporate and business uh, right. representation. But, you know, I, I have to say we're a little more. The corporations are paying taxes, just not as much as they should be paying. <laughs> so, Jason, you, are you, you really going to justify it like I, that? I'm going to justify it. Yeah, really? I, I am going to justify it like that. And really? I can give you a completely defensible reason why it's occurring that way. But uh -huh. we can definitely dig into that once we get that guest, once we start getting on that topic. Hey, I, I'm more than happy to represent <laughs> what the businesses are about. I am very excited about that. And have I'm glad you're here going to be representing for Not the corporations problem. that make millions of dollars. Um, and then later on in the show, we will be talking about student uh, well college sports students actually unionizing the what the players so there was a big um verdict the national labor relations board they actually had a ruling and they said that students at northwestern mm -hmm. university should be able to unionize and they should be considered as employees so that means they should be paid and i've been asking a lot of people yeah and we got a really great comment on instagram a lot of people i'm talking about like you know what these students, they get a free ride. A lot of them get stipends. A lot of them don't have to go to class. They're not accounted for. You want to give them a salary, too? Can Meanwhile, I you have all these people. You have people who are studying to be biochemists. People are looking to um, find the next cure for AIDS. Why don't we pay them I something? I think it just starts a slippery slope there when you're talking about that. I mean, right. how do you value... Well, I understand there's more of an immediate return on investment on a student athlete at a Big Ten university as opposed to some third year chemistry student who's a research assistant. But who knows, you know, in the long term, how do you place a value on but that? But at so. the same time, it's like these guys aren't eating. I, you know, after we had the conversation Thursday night about doing this topic, I actually happened to catch the student from UConn speaking about the fact that he goes yeah. to bed hungry He's and they lying. have him. Well, can he get a. Don't they have work study? And right. last but not least, they, they play well, 60 hours a me, week. You know when what? I'm going to know everything you study. say that when you make your school over a billion dollars a year then you can then you can say that they don't deserve no. to make money but then when you're making when you're, you when you're making more profits than the entire NHL off of the backs of the NCA off the back of college players and then they don't even get health insurance 
No, that's not right. But anyways, go ahead. Sam. Health insurance. I mean, I f- everyone can sign up for Obamacare. Um, besides that, last but not least, Alyssa will be ranting about the GOP. I don't want to say that they're holding back women, even though I feel like they're holding back women because they just all Republicans in the Senate blocked the pair, um, fairness. The Paycheck Fairness Act. That bill so, was never going anywhere. I mean, I don't because of Republicans. No, it was all political theater. That was never going to happen, and, and everyone on the Democratic side knows that. Right. I don't know why we're even having this com- like not having this conversation about the Republicans. They they never said they were open to it. They pushed this bill knowing it was going nowhere. It was all about looking good in front of their base. Just because it's going to go nowhere doesn't mean it's not something we should do or right. talk about. Yeah, you're right. But it wasn't about doing anything this time. It was about looking good in front no, of their listen, base. Listen, this is like 50 repeals of Obamacare. Just <laughs> it's just about looking a certain way, correct? Yeah. It is. So, on that note, we're going to take a quick break. I'm oh. not ready to go to break, Selena. No, I'm ready to go. You better not. <laughs> don't upset me like that. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. Stanley's on the one, the P's and twos. I said the P's and twos. The PC ones and twos. There you go. And um, we'll be right back on Let Your Voice Be Heard. We're coming back talking about how the corporate re- corporations are just doing like tax evasion. Yes, they are. Tax avoidance. Veterans have difficulty transitioning their military skills into civilian jobs. In New York City, an estimated 17,300 veterans are unemployed. Are you a veteran in desperate need of help? Do you want to take advantage of a life-changing opportunity? If so, the 369th Veterans Outreach Program is designed to assist veterans in Harlem and surrounding communities. Veteran services include resume preparation, interview workshops, access to interview attire, and reliable transportation. For more information, call the 369th Veterans Outreach Program at 646-533-9292. And we are back. Are we back? This is Let Your Voice Be Heard. What is it? Right here on WHCR. Where? 90.3. FM. Radio. The voice um, of Harlem, Selena. Whatever. Thank you for those ad-libs. Those unnecessary ad-libs. My ad-libs are the best. I'm the best hype man in political radio. <laughs> You yes. know, I, I agree with that, but one thing I got to say, before we cut out before, uh-huh. Selena said tax evasion. We got to uh-huh. be real careful, guys. It's tax, tax avoidance. avoidance. Tax, avo- tax, tax avoidance. Tax avoidance. Evasion is, that's, is that's a whole That's a better hashtag. Tax, tax at, evasion is, is Lex illegal. Luther. It's tax <laughs> avoidance is legal, right. and that's really the big distinction. Lex right. Luther over there with his word semantic sorcery. It's not word semantic sorcery. I'm, I'm trying that. to protect you guys, keep you from being liable for some, uh, what is this? Uh, this would be slander, wouldn't it? Be? Uh, mm-hmm. It's hard to slander. Sl- like it's hard to slander 
a, like a, a term or the government, you okay. know, like when you say tax avoidance, I mean, it would just be us I- being incorrect, which right. we, don't, we okay. don't want to be incorrect. Oh, thing I didn't speak that. It would be one yeah. thing. It would, it's different We're not than, citing anyone directly. Right, it's different if the, yeah. we said this I, company. I'm going to say companies. You're going to say yeah, companies? I really am Okay, right generalities, now, generalities. I am. So a recent study by the research firm Audit Analytics, they reveal that uh, the amount of corporations stashing profits in offshore accounts to avoid play- paying U.S. taxes here at home has risen by 93% since 2008. And not only that, but $2.1 trillion, trillion with a T, and untaxed profits are currently being stored overseas. Under U.S. law, corporations do not have to pay income tax on most of their overseas profits until they are brought into the United States. These earnings can then be held overshore, offshore for years if they are classified as indefinitely invested abroad. So that's exactly what they're doing. This is law. They are um, legally able to do this. So then you have these big companies like GE, General Electric. Don't forget Apple. Right. So let me just give you the number breakdown. So GE is actually storing one uh, 110 billion dollars. They have the biggest pile of earnings stored abroad. Apple, which Jason just mentioned, is storing about 54.4 billion dollars uh, overseas as well. And Congress, our, our government, they've been quarreling over this for years. I'm um, saying that the law lets multinational stash profits aboard tax abroad tax free. So some favor killing the law, which is known as offshore corporate income tax. Tax deferral, and some say we should support a one-time tax holiday that will let companies bring foreign profits home um, and tax them at a low rate. So we're going to get more into. We have a very special guest on the line. His name is Professor Lawrence J. Um, Kotli Kotli Koff. Sorry about that, Kotli Koff. He can correct. I heard the struggle in your voice before you. Even I know. Started. I know. You I'm sorry about confidence. that. Gotta have confidence, Kotlikov. Say Kotlikoff, it with your chest. Thank Nina. you. Say it with your chest. No. <laughs> and then he is he he's a um he's a professor of economics at Boston University. Good morning, professor. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. And. Uh Good that you're discussing this uh, important issue. Yes, this is very important, and we're very happy to have you on. We know we don't have you for long, so I kind of want to just get right into it, to the nitty-gritty. So the first thing that I want to kind of dig around with is a lot of people are saying, you know, on both the right and the left, we need to reform the tax code policy. And if we do so, it would encourage job growth. How is it, how is it, how do these corporations affect job growth and the economy by storing all of this money overseas? Uh, They don't because they are investing abroad because uh, it's uh, for tax reasons, it's more profitable. So, we want to give them no incentive to invest over uh, overseas. We, we'd like to get um, more jobs in the U.S., and that means bringing the capital back to the U.S. So the way uh, I would recommend we do this is not to have a corporate tax at all, and that sounds like a big uh, break for the rich who own corporations, a big boondoggle for the rich, but uh, what I would do is not really eliminate the corporate tax, but reposition it so that if you own own shares of, uh, if you own a corporation, if you're the shareholder of a corporation and an American citizen, you would have to pay taxes at the personal income tax level on all your worldwide corporate profits, no matter where they were earned. So if I own shares of General Electric and they make money abroad or in the U.S., uh, whatever, my share of the worldwide profits will be subject to annual taxation as it accrues, as those profits accrue. So we would get rid of the corporate tax, but we'd have uh, business profits being taxed at the personal level. This would be the same treatment as we have for uh, what are called subchapter S corporations and for proprietorships and partnerships. So all those profits from businesses are being taxed at the personal level right away as they're earned. I'm just saying that the uh, corporations should should have to face the same, you know, be treated the same way. And this would mean that corporations would have no incentives to invest abroad relative to the U.S., no tax incentive, because... No matter where the money was earned, it would face the same taxation. Right now, if you earn money abroad through GE, you can, as you just said, defer the taxes and and, uh, save uh, that way so that um, there's an incentive right now under the current law for uh, companies to work abroad and um, hire people in foreign countries, not in the U.S. I'm actually glad you brought that up. Because I wanted to know, could we incentivize actually keeping the money here? Or, I mean, 
is is that a, a feasible solution or should we just aim for legislation that would change the tax code and change policy? I th- no, uh, what I just proposed would, would provide, relative to the current system, where, where there's a big incentive to in, to produce abroad and invest abroad, uh, earn your profits abroad because they're facing essentially a much lower tax. Uh, I What I'm proposing would say... Look, people are going to be taxed on their corporate income, on their corporate profits at the personal level. If they own a company, no matter where it makes profits, they're going to have to pay taxes each year under their own annual income tax. But there won't be any corporate tax per se, so corporations won't have any incentive uh, to operate abroad relative to operating in the U.S. It would, have, it would be a neutral playing field. So compared to the current system, what I'm proposing would lead to companies investing in the U.S., uh, retaining uh, their investments in the U.S., bringing money back to the U.S., and uh, and hiring more American workers, and we certainly need more jobs here. Hello, Professor. Um, this is Jason. Uh, one question about that: When it comes to the companies or corporations, rather that have utilized the deferral loophole, for lack right. of a better terms, I, I recall that maybe a few years ago there was a sort of uh, there was a tax holiday that was granted right. somewhere in the area of 300 or 400 billion dollars I can't quite remember the exact number however a caveat to bringing back those uh, those revenues that have been overseas for so long I would be afraid would be that as in the earlier tax rate um, tax holiday a lot of that money was used to just pay down debt uh, to uh, okay but let me let me be yes. clear I wouldn't provide anybody a tax holiday no a tax holiday at all that, okay. money, that money needs to be taxed so we're moving to what I'm proposing which I call the common sense tax Understood. And there's a website called the Common Sense Tax dot org. I would immediately tax all those deferred profits at um, uh, at the personal level. So you know, I would not continue with this tax break. And these companies who have deferred their taxes, they owe those taxes. And uh, I would just put an end to the deferral. But I'd also eliminate the corporate tax, but t- reposition it at the personal level. So we have. Uh, I'm not forgiving any. Uh, you know, Apple. Any freebie, you know, they've already avoided taxes for decades, whatever years. They should not be given uh, scot free for moving to a new system. So, so we the- can, uh, under transition rules, hit them up for that tax they owe and then put everybody on the level playing field where they're paying no tax at the business level, but ever- all the corporate shareholders are paying tax at the personal level. Right. So you would implement that that C um, C corporation taxation level as it as it sort of exists today. What particular percentage would you utilize? We all know, and we hear it ad nauseum that thirty five percent is the corporate tax rate currently. Though we know that the effective tax rate is actually quite a disparity between the two. Is there a particular number that you would utilize? Well, uh, under what I'm calling the, is the common sense tax proposal, nobody would there would be a uh, two two major changes relative to the current system. One is we would have a a FICA tax, uh, 13% on all earnings, not up to just some ceiling, but make the tax uh, proportional to all earnings, but at a lower rate, 13% in combined employer plus employee. Well, actually, the employer would pay the entire 13% under this proposal, but um, that's compared to a 15.3 combined employer-employee tax. And then on the in- personal income tax side, I would tax no income up to $100,000, so we have a zero if you're married, you wouldn't pay any taxes if your income was below 100,000. Above 100,000 would be a 25% rate. If you're single, it'd be 50,000. Above 50,000, a 25% rate. So if you earn corporate profits through your ownership of a corporation, if you got shares of GE and your share of the corporate profits this year are 10,000 bucks and you otherwise have $150,000 of income, maybe wage income, then you're going to have to pay taxes on 160,000. So everything above a hundred thousand, which would be sixty thousand dollars in this case, would be taxed at a twenty-five percent rate. So I'm talking about uh, a zero corporate income tax, but repositioning, but including in the personal income tax your share of the corporate profits as to some as a form of personal income because it really is. If you own a corporation and the corporation earns money for you, it's really your personal income. So let's call spade a spade. And Mitt Romney may think that corporations are are people. Uh, but they're not actually people. They're owned by people, and uh, we shouldn't get confused about that. And it's the people, the rich people who own it are getting the tax break, so let them not get a tax break. Let's, let's get the tax rates down to a reasonable level so everybody has an incentive uh, to work and save, but, and uh, poor people are given a break. 
that's what this uh, proposal has in it. Uh, and we, we make the FICA tax uh, proportional rather than highly regressive. And uh, But let's also um, uh, give the corporations no reason whatsoever on the, on the tax side not to work, uh, not to operate in the U.S. That's true for whom. Uh, so this is, this is the common sense tax. And economists, I think, would, uh, you know, we've been proposing things like this for years. Maybe now is the time that Congress will uh, take these plans and, and move ahead with them. Makes sense to because, me. Yeah, I mean, there's a win-win here for both for both parties. The, the Republicans can say they're getting rid of the corporate tax, which they would be, but at the personal level, they would have to pay the rich Republicans and rich Democrats. Everybody would have to pay taxes on the corporate profits at the personal level. And we'd also have ten, tax simplification, two rates rather than you know, zero and 25 percent, a lower lower rates for everybody, but a broader base. There'd be no breaks, tax uh, breaks into what I'm proposing. We'd accept for the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, which are very important um, in terms of keeping the system uh, progressive. But apart from that and the charitable deduction, we have a completely simple, uh, straightforward tax system. No other tax breaks, no 401k deductions, nothing like that. Uh, we wouldn't have an army of accountants uh, trying and regulators trying to minister the corporate income tax. And, uh, you know, I, I agree, again, We've got this tax treatment of uh, proprietorships, partnerships, and some Chapter S corporations. So it's not like I'm proposing something that we haven't been doing for decades. Right. And what you're saying, it, it makes so much sense. I just want to know if you can sort of update us or fill us in. It, can we come to a bipartisan agreement to pass legislation um, that would sort of just reflect common sense tax laws or reform? Where do you think that the, the Congress and our, our nation stands when it comes to that? Well, you know, the, the members of Congress like to fight over words, but if we talk about repositioning the corporate tax, then the Democrats, I think, can live with that. Republicans can like it. And, and you know, this is people, uh, the most important thing for poor people is to have jobs. Rich people get jobs. It's poor people that are out of work or get crappy paying jobs. And getting companies to operate in the U.S. is the key fact, factor to try and raise the incomes of the uh, of the poor. So the Democrats should want to do anything they can to stimulate job growth, and that's what this proposal would, would do. So I think that, you know, I wrote a column in the New York Times back in January, an uh, editorial, and it was it's called Eliminate the Corporate Tax. The editor chose the title. I was going to call it Reposition the Corporate Tax, but they, they have the right to set, set the title. But anyway, the fact that the New York Times uh, published this uh, column you know, and every uh, left of center uh, suggested even they are understanding the the, the people on that editorial board are understand that uh, this is something that could help their uh, the people they seem to be most interested in, which are the poor. And uh, I'm interested in the poor too, but I think I think Republicans are as well. I think everybody right. has a degree of fairness in their heart. And uh, I've talked to a lot of Republicans, a lot of Democrats in my day, and. Uh, I don't see that their values are all that different. Well, I don't know that, you know, one set of people is more charitable when it comes to their own private charity than the other. Uh, I think we're in this boat together, but what we have here is Congress made up of 535 members, not one of whom has a Ph.D. in economics, not one of whom is specialized in public finance. So they're making a mess. Right. No, I, I, I agree with that. And, and, you know, it's interesting because I just want to talk for a second um, about return on investment. There was a study done last year, and I know it was published by Mother Jones, um, and it was they made really great graphics, actually. Uh, but it basically said that when we give people food stamps, the return on investment is about $1.67. So for every dollar the government spends on food stamps for low-income people, we put a dollar sixty-seven back into the economy. But for every dollar we spend uh, giving uh, rich people and corporations tax cuts, it only puts 32 cents back into the economy. So what's the incentive for us to give more of these tax cuts? I mean, the idea is under this trickle down, which I call voodoo economics, that if we give them tax cuts, they're going to create jobs and put that money back into the economy. But it seems to me like we're not seeing that return on investment, so we have no incentive to do so. What's your thoughts on that? Well, we have a lot, a lot of different tax transfer programs, and we, we're just trying to get a picture right now of uh, I and others are at, uh, that I'm working with are trying to get a real handle on the tax, overall tax progressivity of the system. Uh, I don't think anybody really knows because there's so many different 
tax systems that are in play, federal and state, and as you said, food stamps and uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, all these things have, uh, there's Medicare Part B premiums that are progressive. So in order to get a true picture, whether the rich are being, you know, uh, uh, given too big of a break or not paying enough, we have to do more careful study, and that's, not, that's underway. Um, but uh, I, I think the system is going to turn out to be uh, much more regressive than is commonly believed, so I'm kind of agreeing with you. I think these uh, these studies that say, you know, this amount of help for these people does this much for the economy are fraught with question marks. I think the real thing is that uh, basically we have people with different skills, different educational uh, opportunities, and and uh, and we have a lot of inequality that's kind of natural born, and we have to be generous to people that haven't had as good a deal. Right. Professor, we agree with you wholeheartedly. We want to thank you for your time and also give you a chance to let our listeners know how they can follow up, read your writings, um, your columns, anything, or, or contact you, yeah. possibly. At kotlikoff.net is my main website, kotlikoff.net. Okay. Cool. Hey, kotlikoff.net. We'll tweet that out as well. Anything else? Uh, uh, that's it. Happy to talk to you guys again. Thank you so much. We happy we're, we were happy to have you join us on this Sunday morning. Enjoy the rest uh, of your Sunday. Okay, it's good. it's good to have a station that's really focused on serious stuff for a change. Thank right, you so much. Right, Definitely right. Definitely appreciate the enlightenment. We do. We thank you. Okay. So we're going to continue the conversation right after this break. We're talking about the corporate, excuse me, corporate tax loopholes. And the fact that corporations don't seem to be paying anything, but we're paying a lot of money as regular Americans and regular workers. We'll be right back and let your voice be heard. <laughs> I'm so fresh, man. Man, y'all scared to do it how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Jay's on my feet. I can't pay my rent. <laughs> I'm on the corner. Can you swipe me on your metro card? <laughs> Jay's on my feet. Right. And on Is that, that note, we are back. Yes, that's at every station now. I mean, every I station know. I get off at on the two line, the five line. I take those days every day to work. There's yeah. somebody there asking me for a metro card swipe. swipe. What's, yeah. what's going on today? I don't yeah, know. maybe it's because I'm paying too much. Yeah, it taxes. might be. It might be that song. <laughs> yeah, my, my the Jordans. Com- my confusion is like I'll see people like really nice clothing doing that. It was like you didn't have a plan to get on a train before you left the house. You, just, so you got them. Got them fly. Just like you on. got good shoes, but you yeah. can't get to work. They should jump the turns. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> um, they should. Maybe they're paying too much taxes, right? Or maybe that's just my segue back maybe to the no, segment. Maybe yeah. the MTA has just gotten really expensive, un- yeah. and yet the service has gotten worse. The Jordan, right. t- the Jordan taxes. Honestly, that is so the much. worst agency in the entire city. They should dismantle the whole thing. I'm glad we don't have MTA <laughs> guests today. I will strongly disagree with you right. um, by a lot. Um, I think you don't get, we don't get the MTA enough right. credit for like the intricate work that they do, but that's another conversation. Thank you for that. Okay, so back to the conversation. This is Let Your Voice Be Heard. We are talking about companies who are stashing billions of dollars overseas. Jordans. Let me actually, no, they're not stashing it in Jordan boxes. They're bigger <laughs> than that. They're actually stashing $2.1 trillion off in offshore accounts. This is untaxed profits. So we're talking about GE. We're talking about Apple. We're talking about 
um, Merrick and Company and Co. These big name companies. Yeah, right. I, I have you know I have some numbers on that. Can I can I cut in a second? Well, you just did. I'm doing, all right. So Exxon Mobil made 19 billion right. in profits in 2009. They only they paid no federal income taxes and they received a rebate of 156 million. That comes directly from their SEC filings. Uh, Bank of America received a 1.9 billion tax refund from the IRS last year, even though they made 4.4 billion dollars in profits and they received a bailout from the U.S. Treasury Department of nearly a trillion dollars. Over the past five years, General Electric made $26 billion in profits. It received a $4.1 billion tax refund. That comes from right. the source on that is Citizens from Tax Justice and wow. uh, the New York Times. Also, Stanley Chevron. lost his job in August, and now he owes the state $90. <laughs> Chevron, <laughs> Boeing, <laughs> Valero, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, Conoco Phillips, Carnival Cruise Lines. Uh, in fact, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, great, from favorite. the great state of Vermont, actually has an image out there, and he calls it his March Madness tax avoidance bracket. Um, and it basically is done in the style of March Madness, and it shows who the worst uh, tax avoiders are. Right, And right. I think last year it was Allstate right. and Bank of America and some of the other companies I just listed. Thank you so much for that, Alyssa. And I want to say, while these companies are deferring um, deferring, and, and not paying and avoiding paying taxes, if we actually did eliminate deferral, it could increase corporate tax revenue by $50 billion a year, and that's enough to fund universal pre-K every three to four years uh, for every three to four year old in America. Now I, I gotta jump in now. <laughs> now it's, see, I, I've been, let I've been me, let listening. Me give a phone to, I'm gonna let, let you give finish. Give the phone number. I was let me give the phone number. Let me give the phone number. Because we're gonna jump in. If you guys would like to jump in, the number is 212 650 6903. You can also tweet us at beheard underscore radio because it is about to go down. Go it down has there. to. It has to. <laughs> Absolutely. So now that the fo- phone number has been disseminated, let, let's, let's correct some issues here. Let's correct some of these factoids that we've been hearing the whole time. All right. Why is it that so much of this money is being deferred to international tax havens? Let's ask ourselves that question. If the f- tax rate in this country was so incredibly fair and just towards corporations, there would be no need to go to countries like the Cayman Islands or Ireland, actually, which is a pretty you know well-known tax haven. The reason why is because the 35% tax rate, which is the corporate tax rate in this country, is the highest in the world currently. If there's one higher, please notify me. Somebody call in. Let me know because... Having worked internationally for some time, this is this is it. Mm-hmm. No one wants to deal with that rate. Now, once again, as noted with the conversation with the professor, that is different from what's called the effective tax rate, mm-hmm. which is the actual amount of, of cash or revenue that's paid to the federal government. Uh-huh. However, that still does not justify when you compare to other nations, other industrialized nations, mm-hmm. the relatively low and corporation friendly environment that they cultivate and that is why that is going on mm-hmm. so another another caveat to what we're saying we have this concept that if you bring back all this taxable revenue to the united states that will automatically translate to employment that is not right. true mm-hmm. history shows i know i saw that i saw that look that uh look in, <laughs> like, in you know the the scooby-doo it, look now i'm gonna tell you why no no i agree with I'm you i don't exp- know why somebody thought it would no but many people do because we we think that okay wealthy people and this goes back down to trickle down economics that Alyssa mm-hmm. was talking about voodoo economics this was a theory. Okay, if the wealthy have more money, that means that they're going to somehow allow more money to disseminate down to the lower classes, which increases employment and consumerism. It's not true. You know what wealthy people do with money? They invest in other means to create more wealth. Wait, yeah. so did, or did the Republican just admit that trickle-down doesn't work? I, am, I admitted that years ago. It's, okay. it's BS, all right, guys? I would like yeah. to use a stronger <laughs> word, more emphatic, pejorative term for it, but it's complete nonsense. I've never believed in trickle-down Pejorative economics. was a stronger word. No, but however, I still don't believe in you know the, the populist, you? socialist you know uh, fantasy uh, that we're we trying go. to put together if we have this incredibly high, progressive, you know, lack of a better term. And I'm going to use the term progressive, not in the sense that people who are accountants and economists economists know how to use it but in the social sense all right we have this once again we have this concept that that money is going to be utilized directly for employment and reinvestment in people in human capital that's yeah. not true historically what happens is that's used to pay down debt and to pay dividends to shareholders yeah right so once again all you're going to do uh, i mean unlike what the professor was talking about where it sounds like as though he has a very well articulated and researched tax reform system and once again guys i am by no means way shape or form an economist i mean i have a pretty more than rudimentary understanding of public finance and economics but um, i i can't disparage him on that level however what we see is that unless there are some real definitive and comprehensive changes mm-hmm. 
th- which are both fair to the public as well as to the corporations yeah. and maintain competitiveness and parity with the rest of the world, mm-hmm. you're not going to see any real changes as far as h- how taxes are, are implemented in the United States. Well, we're not going to see any real changes because Congress and Senate, they're not going to do anything about this in the first place. So let's but, just, but, let's, but why, is, why is that? Well, because it's helping them right now. You know how much money they get from these big businesses? Uh, now we're talking about lobbying. Right. Yeah, and lobbying. Yeah, exactly. I know that, but, well, I can't talk about that. No, right no, there. no, we can't talk but, about no, no, that. No, 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 we want to talk about that. If, no, we can talk about lobbying. We can't talk about what I was going to say. Oh, uh, all right. But, um, and then and just also, you're, you're right, but also these businesses, yes, the effective the uh, tax rate is 35%, and the real one is like less than that. But then what they end up paying most times is $0. Oh, the, that's right. what's called the negative well, tax rate. Well, they're getting a return. Which is, which is great. Which means not only are they not paying, and, and also remember, we bailed them out. That's another thing. And so, which is is crony capitalism in and of itself? Because in a free market system, there are no bailouts. It's a lot of fair. You, you should right, just let, let, let it happen. You 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 know you fail. I mean, that's a whole other issue about about the bailouts because it would have also affected average Americans. And there and even with the tax issues, there there comes back to this thing, which is a lot of people a lot of people do not realize the interplay between Main Street and Wall Street. And the fact if you have a 401k plan and you own some of these companies, on one hand, your argument is, well, I don't want, and this can make me sound a little bit like a Republican, but on Please. one hand, your argument is, I, I think these corporations should be paying higher taxes. On the other hand, you're like, well, I want to see returns on, on my, my 401k. 401K. So, you and, know, and so there right. is this interplay between, right. you know, that if the taxes, if these corporations have to pay taxes, then you may see lef- less dividends and less return on your 401k and and so you do have to remember even as a liberal you know it's really important to be pragmatic at the same time I have a huge issue with not only them not paying anything but also them them getting a return and I hear what you're saying about the 35 percent you know corporate tax rate being the highest in the world but if you look back during the 50s and the when the economy was booming the corporate tax rate in this country was 90 percent and listen, even if you now, judge now us, i gotta hit you i gotta yeah, hit you with something on. right there even gotta hit you, you with just something. for wait let me finish even if you Please. adjust for inflation the corporate tax rate still is nowhere near the 90 percent it was during that time period. and it can never be that again you know why, why? because after in 1945 we had no competitors left western europe was rubble China was That's communist. Russia was Russia. And th- there was no one out there. So, of course, we could, we could play the field. We, the field belonged to us. Mm-hmm. If you want to operate, 90%. What choice did a corporation have in 1945? Well, also, I mean, this goes back to another thing is remember who, bu- who to a certain extent, spent the money to rebuild Europe. Okay, with well, the that was us plan. as well. So that was us. So we spent money in Europe. They rebuilt. And then now they're competing with us. And exactly. now we have to lower our corporate tax In order to compete with to them. To compete right. with them. Yeah. So... So now we, we, we have to play according to the rules that the market have you but, know manifested. But let's be realistic about this. So yes, maybe the corporate tax rate is it's a little bit too high as per Jason. And yes, you're absolutely right, Alyssa. It used to be at ninety percent. We're not going to get it back to ninety percent. Obviously, we know that. And at thirty five percent, you're saying that it's unfair to these corporations. The bigger problem is, as Alyssa mentioned and I mentioned earlier, a lot of these corporations are paying nothing. Right. They're actually filing taxes and getting money back. Yeah, once yeah. again, that's the, that's the negative tax rate yeah. that I went to right. move to, where they're actually making more money <laughs> by right. not paying taxes. Yeah. And yeah, it's so you know, it's lower the tax rate and get rid of the deductions. Right. There we go. But That's a solution. I mean, yeah, it's a simple solution, but it's is will that ever happen? At least in our lifetime. Are we heading towards that? No, Are we absol- leaning towards that? I can tell you about the political climate of that happening. <laughs> Negative 0.7643. But, well, it's because, because <laughs> corporations just want to keep making all of this money. It's not about that. It's just easy. You know how complicated it is to go through all that kind of tax, all that tax work? And then, of course, you think we're going to have people in there speaking for us in that room? No, it's, Bank of America will. It's not just so the, well, that's the thing. It's not just the tech word. It's like legislation. There's a saying about legislation. It's like hot dogs. You you don't want to know how it gets made. <laughs> um, and it's, it's true. Um, and and so there's. It's easy for me to sit here and say, well, we should just have a real simple law, and even you know have a real simple law where we just say, okay, the tax rate's going to be lower for corporations, but there's going to be no deductions. That sounds really good and simple in theory until you get into all these people about who's writing the law, who has a stake in the law, like lawyers, accountants, and, other, and now, all these now other we gotta, professionals. Now we're getting the pragma- you know, pragmatism yeah. in here. The reality of what it is, is at the end of the day, and Stanley already alluded to it, is that we have the issue of lobbying. Right. And that is what determines legislation in this country. Yep. If this was all about good policy, good economics, yeah, you, you really could sit down because, you know what, when they first came up with the income tax code and the U.S. tax code, that's what they did. They sat down and said, 6%, that's it, that's it, that's all. 
But then, <laughs> you know, seriously, that's how it came together. I mean, obviously, it was more nuanced than no, that. But it was that simple comparatively to the, what, the 10,000-page U.S. tax code currently. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is because every single one of those organizations or companies, excuse me, not organizations, has a representative. And it's not an elected representative. It's a lobbyist who yep. goes in there and tells Senator, Remy. you know, whoever, if you want to be elected again, you're going to take right. this support. Doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to support me. Them. But you're going to you're going to take a look at this and advocate for my industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we still have to have a voice, the people. And I feel like that's where Moral Mondays comes in. That's where we had Occupy Wall Street and even some of the Tea Partiers who are on board about making corporations pay their fair share. Let's Everyone not, else let's has not. to do it. No, I'm trying to say, like, because I, I, I get that there's a lot of nuances. More than likely, we don't see it happening, but I feel like we still need to fight. I feel like we still need to push. But because it's easier to please people than it is to please corporations because you know what happens? I mean, let's think about Occupy Wall Street. How many years ago was that now? About two, two or three. Two, three. No, about four now. Four, okay. I know you you were a part of that, right, Stanley? Like, you you were a part of working groups and all that. About three years now. What was the end result of all that? Oh, God. There was no end result. I said that from the beginning, which is the Tea Party has been extraordinarily successful at getting their candidates elected because they've put somebody in charge. Whereas, uh, you know, but Occupy had a different dynamic because there was definitely, like, a libertarian anarchy thing going on. And then there was a progressive thing. So there was different factions even within the That's the the constant companion of populism. When you're talking about, oh, I'm upset. People are angry. We we hate corporations. We want equitable distribution of economic resources. You need the will to follow up with that type of thing. If you don't have the will to follow up, you know what? We make a big show, dog and pony. Everybody's a little happy for a little while. Oh, they gave us some 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 bread and circuses, and then that's it. And everybody walks away. Yeah, Panama circuses. It it, it was true two thousand years ago. It's still true today. You give people just enough to keep them happy, satisfy the top dogs, give them a few jobs now and then. And I'll I'll say this, and I I have never said this publicly. You know what they could have done to uh, occupy Wall Street? Mm. Somebody could have went down from one of those banks and given the top ten leadership jobs, and that would have collapsed every single. You, if you want to kill something, you kill the head. You chop the head off. Let the body right. wither. That's an interesting that, point. That's true. And I, I, but I think that a, a lot of reasons why this is back in national discourse and a lot of people are outraged about it is because if we look at the disparity and the gap between corp, um, top CEOs and executives, the amount of money they make compared to average workers and how that disparity continues to grow within what the last three decades, I think that, um, see, well, I know uh, used, Alyssa is the time. statistics girl, but I think that the, the CEO the of Walmart I think that I think that the percentage is about like a hundred well, percent you know, difference between I'm what a, a worker at Walmart makes and the executive at Absolutely. Walmart. I was going to speak on that for a second, which is you know the it's not the point I wanted to make, which I'll make in a, in a second, but. On your point, which is there is definitely a disconnect. And what compounds the problem worse with the the tax code and the loopholes that the corporations can take advantage of, and this obviously doesn't apply across the board. It usually applies in places like the retail sector. But, in you know, you look at something like Walmart. So not only are they avoiding tax, you know, avoiding taxes using ta- corporate deductions and loopholes, you have a further situation where they're paying their workers low wages. Almost 80% of Walmart's workers are on food stamps. They spend the food stamps at Walmart. And so on top of the fact that they're avoiding the taxes, there's been a lot of studies done on this that show that basically each Walmart store gets about $400,000 a year when you combine the amount of money they're collecting through the food stamps, the you know the corporate d- deductions and the low tax rate, the the low ta- the low effective tax rate. And so you have this compounded problem where the number one welfare recipient in the country is a, a store where the CEO makes more money in 24 hours than his employee make his employees right. make an entire year. That's it's, a problem. It's ridiculous. That it's brings ridiculous. Us, the fact, you know, these people that want to get up and talk about the president being a socialist couldn't be further from the truth because we're so close to fascism, not to socialism. And it just goes back to this fundamental misunderstanding about economic systems and how they operate. Right. Thank you so much for that, Alyssa. We have on the line with us Frankie, who would like to let his voice be heard. Good morning, Frankie. Yes, I don't know if I can do this in 30 seconds, but uh, I would like to know, okay, the corporations seem to be uh, holding the bar on America. And now America is like want to uh, impose their their, their ideology on, on Russia. We don't want to do we not we don't want the westernized up indoctrination over here because you know you know it seems as though you, 
the, uh, America has its own problem. Why try to to and, and, and to give us problem over there and control us over there? And you cannot even control your own people over here. Right. Thank I, I you frankly, for that, Frankie. I, I'm going to assume that when you say uh, us, that you must be uh, uh, maybe a Russian national, Russian citizen, or maybe immigrated from Russia or somewhere in the uh, former Soviet Union at some point. Uh, I understand completely what you're saying. It's something that I've heard echoed throughout the years from uh, Chinese uh, capitalists and from Russian cap- capitalists that American capitalism is not descriptive or indicative of global capitalism, that there's a different way and a different method w- depending on the cultural context of where you're working. So that is true. Uh, in the West and in America particularly, we do have a certain level of dysfunction when it comes to our practice of capitalism. And to speak on something that uh, Selena already uh, alluded to, what it was is the issue of executive compensation. That's not an issue of comp- of, of uh, taxation. That's an issue of corporate culture. Right, At, right. Back in the 1940s, 1950s, all right, the average CEO made 40 times more than the rank-and-file employee. Now it's 400 times. Right. I think that's the general uh, order of magnitude, excuse me, the general uh, scale. What that is is that simply there's not the same feeling of responsibility to your employee. It's the same reason why you have Carnegie libraries and Rockefeller, you know, foundations and think, well, there's one Rockefeller foundation. The point is, is that as much money as those people made, there was a sense of responsibility to society. Like, you made all this money. So you felt some type of, of mandate to give back and to, to invest in other human beings. So that doesn't seem to exist anymore. I mean, you can go back. 10, 15 years and think about, remember WorldCom and Tyco and oh, all that? Oh, goodness. They, you know, $40 million uh, <laughs> you know, uh, umbrellas or whatever the heck those guys were buying. There's no sense of feeling for other humans, not even a minimal sense of charity. It's all about corporate greed. Oh, yeah, and it's Chinese capitalists. That's an interesting term. I like that well, one. Chinese I know, capitalism I know, I know is, is, you, is like pragmatic liberal. <laughs> right, exactly. It's, it's a unique form of capitalism. No, it's, it's very I different. I agree. Um, were, were we going to break or? Did you have? You yeah, no, I was going to make a like comment, but yeah, if go we ahead. Go, no, go so, ahead. So, um, you know the uh, the one the last thing I want to say is just bring it back to politics for a second, which is the Republican Party, generally speaking, is like we need to reduce the deficit. We need to reduce the deficit, and you know you, if you need to reduce the deficit, there are three ways you can do that. You can cut spending alone. You can raise taxes alone, or you can com- do both. You can cut some spending and you can raise some taxes. And so, to me, the focal point is that there at least some people. I'm not saying all Republicans, and you know, not necessarily. Republicans who are voters. I'm talking about the people who are elected in Congress. There's definitely this disconnect between we want to reduce the deficit, but we're completely against any proposal about corporate taxation whatsoever. And we're not willing to work even with the other party to come up with some kind of solution that is amenable and, you know, to both parties and to the American people. And that's really what we need, which is we can't keep if we want to reduce the deficit, if that's a serious thing. It's then we have to take into account that just cutting spending is not going to do it. Right. You have to bring in some revenue. And right. part of the way we can do that is by fixing the tax code. Fixing the loopholes. Sell natural gas. And sell natural gas and fixing those loopholes. Thank you so much for that, Alyssa. We're actually going to wrap up on that note. We're going to come back to the news roundup one of our favorite segments and then later on in the show we'll be talking about college sports and students unionizing to be paid so we have a great show we're going to keep it going we're going on a quick break but we will be right back on let your voice be heard
nurse set up an IV. And you, her boyfriend, you were the driver? Yes, doctor, but I didn't mean to hurt her. I only had a few drinks. I was just buzzed. Just buzzed? Oh, then your girlfriend is fine. Hey, sweetie. I feel great. She's really okay? What, are you kidding? No. Not really. Okay. Nurse, get me a suture kit. Stat. Buzzed driving. Maybe we should stop acting like it's no big deal. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation and the Ad Council. This is Namdi Asamoa. I play football for the Philadelphia Eagles, but what I do off the field with United Way might be more important. I'm a volunteer tutor and mentor. Why? Because over a million kids a year drop out of school, and that's not okay. It takes 12 years to create a graduate, but it takes about the same time to create a dropout. And the difference between a child becoming one or the other could be me, or it could be you. Studies show that if we get to these kids earlier, their chances are better. And kids who read well by third grade are more likely to graduate. So join me in United Way. Suit up and take the pledge. Become a volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor. Because when a child succeeds, we all succeed. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Take the pledge at unitedway.org. Brought to you by United Way, the Ad Council, and the National Football League. And, and we, we are, are back. Selena, you always try to steal my thunder. I'm going to stone cold stun you metaphorically. I'm still waiting for you to do that. That's right. We are back on Let, Let Your, Your Voice, Voice Be Heard, heard on 90.3 FM WH. Stop trying to speed it up. The Voice of Harlow. I can slow down now. Guys, we just finished up talking about the way that businesses have been taking money from your back pocket and putting it in their front pockets. Populist <laughs> lies. That's populist lies. Yes, yes, yes. Keep thinking that, sir. Well, actually, <laughs> that's working for you so far, Lex Luther. But... Um, we're back, and this is the news roundup where we discuss your favorite news stories throughout the week. Anything that made you laugh, cry, curse, flip a table, or punch the air. If you punch the air and you hurt your shoulder, I'm going to laugh at you in your but face. But that's safe. I'd rather someone punch the air than a person or hurt themselves physically by hurting um, by punching a wall. If they punch a wall, I'd probably laugh at them. But anyways, guys, you can give us a call at 212-650-6903. Again, that number is 212-650-6903. Or you can tweet us at BeHeard underscore radio. And I'm going to start this off with some double... S- some good news slash sad news. So David Letterman has announced that he'll be retiring at the end of 2014, which is the bad news. And the good news, which is also bad news, is that Stephen Colbert will be replacing him. Yes. And this is great news, but it's, it's not good news because I love the Colbert Report. And now he will not be doing it anymore because he'll be doing the the late show. That he's I not mean- going to do it in character either. Yeah, Just exactly. Me. But you knew that was gonna, he wasn't going to do that in character like... That you can't do that. But no. I mean, I feel like his career is evolving. I don't know how much more money he'll be um, a lot. making for the Dave Letterman gig. So I mean, congratulations yeah, to him. Congrats I feel like you know, especially in entertainment, he's been navigating really well, and he's just cri- climbing the scales. And you know, I mean, yeah, we'll miss the old Steven, but come on. And it's good that you know you're right, yeah. evolving past the character right. into whatever his real personality is. I have no idea. Maybe, maybe it's some like some type of combination. Like we don't know. We'll see what comes from it when he starts hosting uh, the show on CBS. And I also heard that they're going to try to, um, well, California, they want, they're trying to solicit the show to stay in um, Hollywood oh, because... Okay. They want to come back to New York. Right, yeah. right. And we know that after Jay Leno left and Jimmy... Fallon took back. over. They came back to New York City. So, yeah, entertainment news right there. But speaking of other things in the news, what about that congressman who was the Republican Southern congressman, Jason, who was caught? I'm just kidding. He, he was caught kissing his staff member. You guys got to brief me to this. I only but, slightly heard about this and inform me. What, what were the details? Maybe there's right. a good explanation for this. Well, the thing is, so he was caught kissing his staffer, uh, like an intense makeout session, and the husband that his, her, the husband came out saying that you know what, not only does this hurt me, but we were longtime friends, and the woman resigned while the the congressman is still in office. So I mean, I feel like there's, I don't know. Like a, a lot of stuff going on with that. There's not really. some Who cares? speculation. <laughs> there's some speculation that it may have been another Republican who leaked the video because they want McAllister out. Right. That obviously is just speculation, and you know I give it only as much credit. So they as found I this give. out by video. Yeah. Oh and yeah. Yeah. Video 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 he was making oh, yeah. out on, on part. the video camera that's above <laughs> his own congressional office. I mean, at least right. if you're gonna do it, go somewhere else. Yeah, I would think this he's got like money to spend for hotel rooms somewhere. Don't cheat on your 
wife when you're a congressman, or if you're going to, don't do it in front of the security Someone cameras. Someone needs to do a ten crack office. commandments for if you're gonna political cheat, scandals. If you're going to cheat on your wife, you need a very interesting email name that no one can track, like Carlos Danger, <laughs> and you need to send your nudes through Twitter. So that no one can find it. Snapchat. That's how you cheat. Yeah, Snapchat. There you go. Snap. Look, yeah, here's I, my penis. Now it's gone. You see? That's how you do it. But somebody could always screenshot that, couldn't they? You can. You have to be fast. Really fast. So speaking of that, we have a caller on the line. We have George on the line who would like to let his voice be heard. Good afternoon, George. <laughs> Good afternoon. I was a little perky at first, but I was ready to roll up my sleeves and just jet on over to there and do, you know, some vroom over there. But somebody pulled my coat and said, oh, let's simmer down with the Russian story. But so I would, but I would like to say, in the news lately, there's been these military base um, shootings. And I don't know if, how, do you, how many of you have ever been into battle? You know, I'm, I'm, you know, some of us as veterans. But do you really feel safe with these these uh, military base shootings around? These these kids is, is just going ballistic. Maybe they're coming home to find out that all that they was fighting for is their girlfriend is on crack, or all their girlfriends and left and left and went to bed with Jody or something like this here, or, or, or switch switch gender gender bended. Uh, yeah, I don't. Then they come over here and now they 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 going ballistic over here. What are we going to do about that? I mean, this is a major concern that the president even spoke about. Is this is this important to you? Yes, it is. And thank you so much for bringing it up, George. If anyone else would like to let their voice be heard, the number is 212-650-6903. Jason, do you mean, have a response? And you can also tweet us at beheard underscore radio. Did you want to respond no, to No, no, I did. Um, I mean, George, once again, thank you. Uh, I'll speak on it because I'm a veteran. I'm not a combat veteran, but I am a veteran. Okay. So I do understand what he's speaking of when it comes to the feeling of safety and general well-being when it comes to the soldiers and Marines, airmen, sailors, everyone who's come back. I, I think what we're seeing here are the residual effects of approximately what, 12 years of conflicts with multiple deployments. I know in the case of the Army, one year or more in some cases, in the case of the Marine Corps, at least, uh, I, what was the Marine Corps, nine months at least uh, uh, seven to nine months in some cases. And so you have, you know, a whole generation of these guys between the ages, ages of 18 and 31, 32, and sometimes older, who are battle-hardened. And they're dealing with the residual effects of PTSD. The same way we had a whole generation of young men and women coming back after Vietnam who are dealing with drug addiction and all the social, you know, struggle and strife that was, you know, apparent in the late 1960s and 1970s. So I, I don't know what's going to occur or what the uh, sort of um, panacea is to assist. Personally, I believe that there needs to be a much stronger approach when it comes to mental health care in, this, in the service. And of course. I can say from my experience, there was at the time a stigma about seeking mental health care. And I, I hope that that's changed on some level with all these returning veterans. These, these are combat veterans, guys. So they're a different classification than your yes. average veteran. They, they, they've seen things that most of us have never seen in our lives and never will see. Right. And it's been so traumatic. I, I, now, I don't know in the case of this l most recent shooting if that was necessarily the reasoning or the rationale behind what he did. However, um, we, we have to be wary and concerned that, you know, th this is an issue that's going to continue to reverberate for years. And I also want to point out that we did do an entire segment on the shooting yep. last week. Yes, we and if you did miss our show, you know, so we did actually cover it. Yes. We really do care about that topic. And we, you know, we devoted a 45 minute segment to it. If you missed our show last week, you can go to our website, which is www.lyvbh.com. And you can click where the archive shows are and, and you will be able to see or listen to, I'm sorry, the uh, last week's show where we did discuss that topic in detail. And speaking of the Fort Hood, Fort Hood shooting, <laughs> we have on the line with us Mary, who has her own perspective and who would like to let her voice be heard. Good afternoon, Mary. Good afternoon. Uh, it was said on another show that I get most of my news from that this young man had just lost his mother and his uh, grandmother or his mother, or another close family member. It was two members that he lost. He asked for leave. They gave him 24 hours for the two. So that's probably what set him off, you know. And and the other uh, people on the base with the big brass um, awards and everything on their breast. They sitting back laughing. This is what said on another radio station. I will not name, but I get most of my news from them, and they gave a detailed explanation. While this gentleman had had an argument with his higher ups, whatever they are, and this is what set him off. Mary, thank and, you so much for that. Yes, and the Fort Hood guy 
uh, nine months ago or two years ago, nine, whatever it was, he was asking for help. Yeah. I mean, we have to report this, though. We just can't make these people look like they're wild and mad and terrorists. We can't do that. We can't do that to people who have given service to this country. We have to tell the truth. Speaking of doing. speaking but, of wild and mad and terrorists, um, do you hear what's going on? Well, let's. Well, before we shift gears, we got to make sure that we, we, you know, Mary, we, we definitely hear you on that one. Um, and, and I think there's this big stigma against people with mental health issues. A guy from two years ago, he was asking for help, and the military was not doing enough to to cater to him and people who needed that assistance. Since then, they have done a good job of improving that support. They had to continue to go further. You're right that he only got, I think, 24 to 48 hours to go and grieve his um past mother or grandmother, and that was in poor taste. But I don't, um, and that may have been a thing that that eventually like made him snap. But the bigger issues are those mental health issues that like you're, you're talking about. Now we've talked about as well. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm really appreciative of you calling in and like sharing that perspective because people matter no matter what's going on with them. And if anyone else would like to call in, the number is 212-650-6903. No, I, I definitely agree. In fact, I, I, I deferred to you, Stanley, because you sounded like you wanted to jump in, but I was mm-hmm. you, you covered a bunch of the things I was going to mention. So oh, I great. appreciate that. Um, but uh, to switch gears just a minute and also to talk about what some people are calling domestic terrorism and other people are, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of different perspectives on this issue, but uh, there's this thing that's been going on for the past week at the, out in Nevada at what's called the Bundy Ranch. It's been a big news story. Ranch. Yeah. Basically, what happened is this guy has been grazing his, his name is Bundy, and mm-hmm. he has a ranch, um, and he's been grazing <laughs> his cattle on federal lands for over 20 years now. Now, actually, believe it or not, it was Ronald Reagan who passed a law during his tenure that said you had to, if you wanted to use federal lands to graze your cattle, you had to pay a certain amount of fees. So this guy, uh, Bundy, he decided that he's not paying these fees. So for yeah. the past, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, he has refused to make any payments as essentially he says that his family was on this land forever and that he shouldn't be subject so finally the federal government got fed up with him last week and the federal bureau of land management uh said you know we're we're coming in. You either have to pay us the money you owe us, or you have to remove your cattle from this land because it's not your land. It's federal. It's federal land. It's everybody's land. Anyways, so he went on the internet, got all these militiamen, Tea Party people, mostly, you know, um, all these loonies. Don't, don't tread on me, <laughs> militiamen, to come out to to the Bundy Ranch in Nevada, and essentially they said that they were going to exercise their Second Amendment rights and so that they the were going to have a standoff, and that they basically were trying to incite the federal government federal law enforcement agents to get into a a shooting a shooting match with them now eventually the federal government some people are saying on the left they're saying caved on the right or say on the right they're saying we won (laughs) but i see it as in the middle which is the federal government actually decided you know what we're not going to engage these people with weapons we don't want to have an armed conflict so instead we're just going to we're going to continue to pursue this but we're going to do it judicially and in a court of law which i think is the right yeah they they don't want another if you guys this goes back nobody wants another ruby ridge or waco or anything like that if you guys remember this this might be a little bit before most people's time here but about 20 years ago there was a standoff out in Idaho. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was the siege of Ruby Ridge, they call it. This is the stuff of legend of militia movements out in the Midwest. I became familiar with this when I was in the military, and we had a few people who, while they were in the service, were very sympathetic, I'll say, towards the militia movement. And th- they know this story, how the ATF, the FBI, and all these federal agencies descended down upon this poor guy. Uh, his his wife and his child were killed. Uh yeah, his, his, two of his children were killed, I believe. Mm-hmm. His friend was shot. It, it was a really brutal, you know, siege from what I'm told. And uh, ever since then, this sticks in the memory of these people. And you guys remember, that's Nevada. That's right. that's God's country, you know, oh, where, 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 you know, a man and his gun and can, can be by themselves. What pisses me <laughs> off the creepy. most about this is the hypocrisy that underlies it, which is, you know, the, the Tea Party likes to call people moochers. You're a moocher. You want this. You're a, this guy. This is the biggest showing of being a moocher. You've been using this land that's not yours for 20 plus plus years and you refuse to follow the law and pay any money towards it whatsoever so you're essentially mooching off the federal government and then you get a whole bunch of people who hate moochers to show up with their guns and defend you for right. being a moocher that's like blatant hypocrisy I'm gonna just say not? something stupid which I, I say at least once a week anyway had that if I had been a federal agency dealing with that I would have went away let them think they won came back the next day and pissed whip him and all his cattle then left because and, and here's here's why I say some kind of nonsense like that pissed because, with his cattle because yeah. you don't want my dad always says you don't want to get into a peeing match if you're going to be the only one that gets wet. 
<laughs> did your dad really say that? No, it was Darren that said that. Okay. But anyways, um, and and what I mean by that is you really should not be throwing stones if you living if like if you can't take what's coming back at you. If they're sending federal agents there to deal with you, and you're gonna come there with your little homeboys with the, your pea shooters and whatnot, don't get mad when you get a couple of trained government officials shooting people. Well, you know that, and that raises another point about the the left. I mean, there are still a large number of people on the left that are the anti-war, anti-violence left movement. Dirty hippies. But I did see an astonishing amount of comments, at least on my own page, about this when we posted an article yesterday of people on the left saying we should drone all these people. The federal government should shoot wow. at them. You know, they okay. it, essentially they were calling it domestic terrorism and saying, you know, if you want to have armed insurrection against the government, then we should take you out. And there's a large movement. On the left, saying, you know, we should stop caving to these people just because well, they well, show know, up this, with their this guns. This is another example of waving of civil rights right. when the cause of the other person is not in consensus with my cause. And this is the same argument, you know, we we have about drones. Right. I, I, you know, one of my biggest issues with the current administration was the killing of uh, an American citizen in Yemen with no trial. Right. You know, that's, that was yes. a blatant violation. But that's also of because you're not you, you, mean like, you mean like the Iraq <laughs> war? Well, was I, I, I mean, that's a whole <laughs> different discussion. That's the that's the concept of just and unjust wars. I'm talking about right. this person is a confirmed, known, or was an American citizen, mm -hmm. and they were killed because yeah. they were targeted as an enemy combatant. Yep. Now, that scares me because I've been a person who's worked overseas. What if I identified as an enemy combatant? What if you identify as an enemy combatant? Oh, boy. That's oh boy! And uh, look at the stuff we're talking right now. We can all be identified right. as. If they want to identify me as an enemy combatant. All they gotta do is look at my credit score. They'll be like, "Forget it." Yeah, <laughs> definitely enemy <laughs> combatant. Yeah, right. I don't think they'll waste time uh, on Stanley. Go, oh, Navy gonna get him. We don't gotta worry. Right. So on that note, we actually have to take the uh, take a close to on the news roundup. But we when we come back after this break, we're gonna talk about sports law. And the legality of student athletes unionizing and be getting paid like employees as they play for college um, teams. So we'll come back to that right here on Let Your Voice Be Heard. Hi, this is Sister Virginia Cotton, and I'll take you to that place every Tuesday morning from 6 to 10 in the a.m. on the Gospel Legends program. We'll lift the Savior and take a trip down memory lane. How far back will I go? Tune in on Tuesday morning, WHCR 90.3 FM from 6 to 10 in the a.m. And don't forget the website. That's the three W's dot WHCR dot O-R-G. I'm so excited. And we, we are, are back. back on Let Your Voice Be Heard on 90.3 FM, WHCR, the voice of Harlem. Yes. And you guys don't even know the amount of talking that was going on, the aggressive talking that was happening in here. So I want to give props to everyone for getting quiet just when I put the mics well, on. Well, you told us to shut up. Well, yeah, because people <laughs> weren't listening. They'll be like, shut up. Yeah, we're my guys are coming back. They're like, it's like a side political conversation always going on about some issue. Exactly, I'm telling you, the conversations behind the scenes are so much more scintillating. No, <laughs> we, they but were. we can't we use were, them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> can't curse. I'm joking. Oh, I'm joking, guys. No, but they're interesting. No, they're that was good. a very interesting conversation. Yeah. For, for the record, guys, I was going to clear something up from a caller who thought I said something. I did not say that we should bomb Iran. What? That was not. That was never a comment that I made. I mentioned um a comment that Sheldon Adelson made oh, about okay. Iran, and then they right. thought that I was like endorsing bomb. I ran. That was never a thing that I was interested in doing. On that note, guys, <laughs> this is Let Your Voice Be Heard on 90.3 FM. And we are getting ready to talk about um, college sports and unionizing. So as some of you may know, Northwestern College football team petitioned to be seen as a union and collect to collectively bargain. They were approved of this. And, um, you know, what it really what it really does is open up the opportunity for athletes to be compensated um outside of their scholarships for the work that they kind of put in for these schools and it's opened up this huge debate throughout the NCAA National Collegiate Athletic Association 
um, in regards to like how people are compensated. It kind of came to a head earlier this week when the star point guard at UConn, whose name is slipping my mind at the moment, I'm not going to... Shabazz Napier. Thank he's, you. I was going to say Nazir He's Napier. really cute. All right, anyway. <laughs> Selena's mic is off now. <laughs> so, as I was saying... Um, Shabazz Napier said that he goes to bed hungry every night. And in that case, he is a damn liar. Um, <laughs> he's not. He's not going hungry at all. Trust me. But um, but it playing bowl if he's going to bed hungry every night. Yeah, right. Just curious. He's yeah. He's like, right. oh, you know, sometimes. And but it does bring up a fair point. The NCAA college basketball. These schools are making billions of dollars. Oklahoma's football program made more money than the entire NHL last year. Oklahoma made four billion dollars. And I was just in TV revenue from the college sports. And these players, some of them have full scholarships. None of them have health insurance. They don't get any kind of stipend. Um, if they take too much food from an independent organization, they can be suspended. If they take gifts from someone, they can get in trouble or lose their right to play. If their coach leaves the school to go to a better contract and they transfer, they have to sit out for a year. A lot of them are not really, they don't have enough time to take classes because they're working on average 50 hours a week with all the playing, the practicing, the promo related activities because people want to meet them. So they have to sign autographs. Their likenesses are used on endorsements and merchandise and they get zero dollars from it. And so that's where we come today with this conversation of whether these college athletes should be compensated. If so, why? And if not, why not? Um, and to help us with this conversation, we have two really great people in the room with us today. Well, I am person. one of them. So actually, I am. Selena is a horrible person. <laughs> oh, and you can find out more, more about that on www dot selena is a loser dot com anyway and dot net but we actually <laughs> have one great person in the studio and another one on the phone i want to start off with the person in the studio is daryl johnson excuse me daryl johnson and he's a founder of Raz and jazz sports so you guys probably already know jazz because we're always talking about him he's always tweeting us always giving the good comments and calls in sometimes while he's eating the cornbread was it the cornbread <laughs> you said you were eating that day that's right i should have brought the cornbread today yeah man listen <laughs> stop playing i'm trying to eat healthier now <laughs> <laughs> you would have seen a different Stanley in here. You should have brought us some. Yeah, True. I had some last night, but I still would have liked some more. Stop hazing me, people. Dag. Oh, I want some cornbread now. Anyways, he's also a columnist for the New York Beacon and a contributor for Gospel Herald and MSG Varsity, among other outlets. He covers many area teams and events, and also he's generally an amazing person who also has a show here at WHCR. So he's doing everything, everywhere, with anything. What's You got a show we don't know about? Yeah, tell us about your show. Well, I appear on. Uh, okay, you appear on, on, on the on other show shows right? in WCR. No, no, take full credit, man. Just play it all. <laughs> when is that show? Uh, Mondays uh, from five to six p.m. So you hear that? If you if you're interested, you should listen in on WHCR Mondays five p.m. Yes, and along with Jazz, I ha- also have a new bro who's on the line right now, and we, and you guys know how I do when I have a segment. All of my segment guests are my best friends. Jazz are best friends now. That means you have to buy me a bottle of Hennessy. I prefer white. So go to DR to get that for me. And my new best friend is Andre Douglas Pond Cummings. Excuse me. Did I, is that all of his name or did I just butcher it horribly? <laughs> but anyways, he's an associate dean for academic affairs and professor of law at Indiana Tech Law School and the author of Reversing Field, Examining Commercialization, Labor, Gender, and Race in a 21st Century Sports Law. Um, Andre is also, he also went to Howard University. And Which is a very a good, oh, for, he, uh, he got his JD there, well, actually. I'm, that can I finish? Oh, I'm sorry, Ooh. Stanley. I'm like, sorry. No. You were looking at me. Yeah, because you. So, all right, guys. So Selena has this propensity to make really weird faces, and it makes you think that something is going wrong. I'm so sorry. I was just like just mentioning Andre's information, and then her like her eyes got really big, and she started shaking her head profusely. So <laughs> I thought something was wrong. But anyways, Andre went to Howard for his JD, and I heard he's a fan, a huge hip hop fan. Andre, I gotta ask you this question: Do you still listen to current hip hop? Because my ears hurt when I try to listen to Hot 97 now. Um, I, I'm old school, so it's the uh, it's the old school revolutionary voices of hip hop that uh, uh-huh. still resonate with me. All Chuck right, all D, right, all right. right? Yeah. Tupac, I, all that. I also like the old school. My current favorite rapper is Little B. He has a song called Ellen DeGeneres. I'm lying right now. Um, <laughs> Andre, how you doing today? Doing great. Thanks so much for the invitation. No problem. We're happy to have you over here, and you know I'm excited about this conversation that we're gonna have. So first off, I guess before we even get into anything at all, I just want to. For um, the people who are listening right now, just just give us a quick rundown, if you may, of what has been happening with this whole collective bargaining discussion in college sports. Cool. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. So, so you know, for for maybe a decade now, the NCAA model of student athlete and amateurism has been broken. 
Uh, as soon as we have the opportunity to give coaches multi-million dollar contracts that they can breach and leave at the drop of a hat, as soon as we're paying Miles Brand and Mark Emmert, the head of the NCAA, million dollar contracts, uh, as soon as we have multi-billion dollar contracts for the NCAA March Madness uh, basketball tournament, uh, and at the same time we restrict the ability of athletes to uh, make any money off of their name or off of their jersey sales or off of endorsements. I mean, if an athlete literally endorses a product, they can be declared ineligible from playing in the NCAA. As soon as we don't allow athletes to leave and transfer schools when their coaches do, and to the extent that the, one of the major major rules in the NCAA is you cannot play or practice more than 20 hours a week, and we literally have players that are practicing and playing 40 and 50 hours a week. The entire NCAA model of student-athlete and amateurism is, is broken beyond repair, and the NCAA has taken no steps to modernize or evolve or recognize that they're making raking in millions, if not billions of dollars on the backs of these student-athletes without really giving them an opportunity to share in the profit, uh, we have a significant problem. And so the Northwestern football players led by Kane Coulter, their outgoing uh, quarterback, decided to actually make the NCAA, uh, um, you know, put it on, hold their feet to the fire and say, you know what, we are literally employees. We are not student-athletes. We make money as employees for the school, and you need to recognize us as such. And if they do, if the NLRB recognizes these players as employees, they have the right to unionize and then collectively bargain with those private employers at Northwestern for terms of employment, meaning restrictions on the numbers of hours they work, uh, pay uh, for play, essentially, and an opportunity to have health benefits and actually be treated as what I believe they currently are in the NCAA climate, which is employees rather uh, than student-athletes. And so that's where we stand today. We stand today at a place where student-athletes have the opportunity to possibly at private universities unionize as employees and begin to come to a bargaining table and actually uh, bargain for uh, their opportunities to play and, um, you know, uh, have the opportunity to receive health benefits and receive compensation for the work that they put in. Thank you so much for that, Andre. You sound very passionate about that, too. I appreciate it. I just want to add mm -hmm. in one thing that Alyssa mentioned um, off air is that they cannot receive, like, promotional gifts either. So if Taco mm -hmm. Bell is doing a promotion because, say, mm -hmm. UConn won the national championship on their campus, they're like, congratulations, UConn. Everybody everybody there gets one freak on um, Gorgita, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. And if, mm -hmm. say, um... Um, if one of the players, um, you know, Sebastian Napier eats that gogita now, mm -hmm. he can lose eligibility because of it. For, the, yeah, for real, the NCAA has totally lost its way. It, it is so focused on these arcane rules. You know, one of the things that frustrates me the most is that student-athletes that want to go to college and actually be a student are often steered into majors that are easy so that they can maintain NCAA eligibility and play. They might want to be a veterinarian, and they have coaches saying, you can't, you can't go to the architecture school or the veterinary school because your grades may suffer because the major is difficult. So here, go into these easy majors so that you can maintain your eligibility and play, whereas student athletes have really become, uh, it, you know, that whole concept has become lost where you're steering them into majors and not allowing these students to be the kind of students they want to be in college. You're right about that. But here's my question. We're talking about, you know, the way the NCAA is holding these students back. Well, why would they change? You're talking about an industry that's making billions of dollars off of these students. And it's pretty. And I like I like to um, mention the episode of South Park I saw one time where Cartman was trying to make this league. So and he literally went to the NCAA, like the NCAA headquarters and was like, how do you make people work for free? And have them be <laughs> slaves without no one knowing. And he goes, We don't have slaves here. This is we offer college scholarships. And he goes, That's perfect. They can be slaves, but if you say you give them housing and an education, it's totally cool. But mm -hmm. when, when you talk mm -hmm. about the amount of money that the NCA is making all these all the back of these people, and then the level of punishment they can get for even getting a freaking uh, um Mc, 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 or whatever it is that they have served McDonald's mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. It's 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 just amazing. But then the question remains is, as college athletes, what would that mean if we were now relax these and change the policies in the NCAA and allow them to collect collectively bargain? What will be yeah. fair? 
two good questions. One is why would the NCAA change? And, and, and honestly, the reason that the NCAA has to change is because the NCAA is a volunteer organization. So any university that's a part of the NCAA voluntarily agrees to be a member of the organization, and then they use college presidents to sort of help set policy for NCAA uh, athletics going forward. It's, it's, it's totally within the realm of possibility that major universities withdraw their membership from the NCAA and begin a different organization. Since it's a membership volunteer organization, the NCAA could go away. And if you have enough college presidents that decide that they don't want to be members of the NCAA and withdraw, the NCAA could literally crumble. And that's what I think is on the horizon. If the NCAA doesn't get with it and figure out a way to make uh, the student-athlete model real again, or at least compensate the players that put in their heart and soul into these uh, universities and receive you know, no compensation in return, the NCAA is going to crumble and go away. So, so that's the first question. The second, the second response is that you know, as far as the student-athlete is concerned, a lot of people still argue that the benefit of a scholarship and the opportunity to get a degree and have housing and food while you live on campus is still worth it. It's still, it's still enough of a trade-off that if you get a free education and if you get the opportunity to get a degree in four years, then that is compensation enough. That's the counter-argument, is that if you're getting a degree and an opportunity to uh, you know, actually uh, you know, live for free, get food and board, um, and get a degree, then that's compensation enough, and the student-athlete model is still viable. So the counter-argument is that the scholarship is enough. The problem is is that these kids aren't being allowed to be student-athletes. They, they work way more than 20 hours a week. They often can't take the majors they want to. They're often steered into bogus majors, and I, I don't mean to integrate you know, sociology or, you know, sports management as bogus majors, but, but, but you know, the, the athletes are sort of uh, um, directed into these majors that make it easy for them to pass the classes and grades, and they're not really employable in sociology or sports management after they graduate, if they do graduate. All right, Jazz, go ahead. That that was actually one of the points that Kane uh, Coulter, uh, the the quarterback from the, from Northwestern, made to the NLRB that that. Uh, that uh, prompted this decision to be made. Um, let's 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 be specific about this. This is all about the finances. Yeah. Uh, so so we're not talking about a a volleyball player getting compensated. We're talking about the football players. We're talking about the basketball, uh, players. The basketball players. This is this is a money grab. The reason why players are starting to fight back uh, in the Ed O'Bannon case, where where. They sued the NCAA for using their likeness in college vi- video games mm-hmm. uh, and and the like. That's that's what it's about. The the, the most the two most recent contracts that the NCAA uh, signed uh, the football playoff system that begins this year. They signed a a ten year contract worth seven point three billion dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, the NCAA tournament uh, for college basketball is currently in a fourteen year contract worth ten point eight billion dollars. And and, and these athletes generate that that money, uh, but but the problem that you have is how how do you compensate athletes? Mm-hmm. Do you compensate just the football players? Do you right. compensate the football players and the basketball players, or do you make it a level playing field and compensate all students based on what type of revenues the school itself generates? If you get into the revenue generation, what accounting principles are you, are you using? So, so this is a very uh, complex uh, uh, issue, and 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 like uh, the gentleman said, the NCAA is is way behind on this because they haven't even shown any movement toward. Uh, compensating players a little bit. They still have their arcane rules. And doing some of my research on this, this is actually uh, uh, a rule that if a coach sends you a friend request on Facebook, you're not allowed to to deny that friend request. <laughs> so 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 they they have they have literally gotten that that uh, uh, juvenile when yeah. it when it comes to their treatment of student athletes. Selena. Well, yeah, and, and uh, Jazz, you bring up so many good points. How do we compensate? What's the measure? What's the, the scale um, of paying and compensating athletes? And not only that, I want to add in when it comes to female athletes, right? So this is going to go for both sexes. Um, so I want to get, so Andre, can you chime in? Jazz made a lot of good points. What would you say would be the way or the rate that we pay both athletes? And how does this affect or should it, how or should it affect 
women? Well, so, you know, the excellent points and questions, thanks. Uh, one of the things that's crazy about this ruling is that the NLRB uh, ruling to allow the Northwestern players to unionize, the, the NLRB and the and National Labor Relations Act only apply to private entities. So so now we're talking about, a, we're talking about private institutions, athletes being able to unionize, but public universities, you know, University of Alabama, Ohio State, UCLA, those athletes not having the ability to unionize. So we already have a crazy uneven playing field as far as who this ability to unionize is going to apply to. And then both Chaz and, uh, and this, you know, your comment both go to this point of how are we going to appropriately compensate athletes. So first of all, we're talking about compensating athletes at private universities, and then do we only compensate athletes that are at, in revenue-generating sports like men's football and then, you know, men's basketball and some women's basketball teams generate revenue, uh, or are we going to compensate athletes across the board? And if we just decide, if there's a decision made, as we said before, these are complex issues that are fraught with, you know, uh, issues. If we decide just to compensate men's revenue-generating sports, then we violate Title IX, which allows equal opportunity for females in athletics, and you're going to see a Title IX lawsuit right off the bat if female athletes aren't able to unionize. And then you have to ask the question, you know, on these teams, does the third string long snapper get compensated the same way the starting quarterback gets compensated? And so, you know, the only system it seems to make sense to me is one that would compensate all athletes equally across the board for these multi-billion dollar contracts that Jazz brought up. And I think you have to compensate them across the board in all sports as well. Uh, and then that really begins to dilute the amount of money that the players that really generate uh, income bring into the uh, bring into the in, in, into the schools and into, into the NCA. So I, I think the answer to that question is that there are so many complexities that this one ruling brought up that that really smart people are going to have to get together and figure out how to make this work in such a way that students are able to continue to be student athletes and that compensation is fair across the board. One thing I would say off the bat is I think that some kind of trust fund should be set up for these student athletes if we're going to continue to treat them as amateurs so that money goes into a fund that they can actually um, benefit from when their eligibility is up, if we're going to continue the amateurism model. If we're going strictly with the employee model, then we have a lot of work to do to figure out how athletes are going to be compensated, how it's going to be fair across sports, and how it's going to be fair across gender. And those are really difficult questions that that this uh, NLRB ruling brings to the table. Thank you so much for that, Andre. So we got to go on a quick break. But when we come back, I know Selena has another question. And I want to share some um, input that John Calipari, the coach for Kentucky, um, yep. he offered to the um, NCAA about kind of updating their rules so that it can apply better to um, modern this modern era of college athletes. We'll be right back after this quick break on Let Your Voice Be Heard on 90.3 FM, WHCR. Yeah. It's got that time. Yeah. <laughs> time to take off, Pablo. All right, bust the game. Uh-huh. GDOD, get your door out, Pablo. Yeah. Let's go. Hey, still bank here, shout it, yeah, you know what it is. Pocket full of number of bands and bills. Came up from riding that stand to feel. Defend do a deal by 60 mil. You ain't live that life, you perpetrate. You wasn't really trapped serving birds, yeah. You ain't have to beat no murder, can't. Man, you probably couldn't get an old herd today. Round, round my way, can't get murder plan. Ain't no rule play dirty, man. Put some through your jersey, man. If you pop the one song, we can do it again. Okay, H U S T L A G G G A N G. Yeah, we jet pull up, pull up, hop out, hop out. All about the dollar better going ask Gaga, 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 Gaga. Don't want your jewels, don't want your Don't want your money, want your love Don't want your jewels, don't want your Want your jewels, don't want your Don't want your money, want your love I admit that my habit's expensive And you may find it quite offensive But I won't die at the hands of another I'm your mother's sister, your father, brother this family is stupid, attractive, abusive, the way we've acted. Keep it coming, I'm coming around like your friend now. I think you should shut up and sit down. Don't want your jewels, don't want your Don't want your money, want your love. Don't want your jewels, don't want your Want your jewels, don't want your Don't want your money, want your love. Everybody want that money. Shine. Try to quit, but just can't find the time. 
and we are back on Let Your Voice Be Heard on 8.3 FM, WHCR, the voice of Harlem. You guys have no idea what's going on in the background over here. Selena punched me in the ear, oh God. and I pushed her, <laughs> and then Alyssa drop kicked me in the back, and now we just got back up. And unfortunately, you're still here. Yes, but anyways, we're on your stream, so you can see the fight as well. Um, I know we had a comment from Selena. Selena, go ahead. Yeah, so someone left a comment on our Instagram page, Be Heard underscore radio, and it kind of reflects a lot of sentiment that I'm hearing. People, from what I'm hearing, they have a hard time really sympathizing with the college players because of all of the incentives and perks they get. So this one late, this one woman, she wrote that she went to a, a sports-centric university in Texas, and the teams, the, the football players on the teams, they got free tutoring, altered their scheduling for class attendance. They got living and food stipends. Um, of course, they got a free ride. She paid like $50,000 um, for the school and tuition. And, and she was like, and she also talks about it. And she's like, you know, on the weekends, I feel like I'm paying for them to go to school for free. I know that they contribute a lot of money to um, the school and that's valued. But what about people that contribute other things like in, in biochemistry or things that would be considered and um, other things that would help the larger good of society if you're working on again like a cure for AIDS or you're trying to help cancer patients so and and again and I spoke to a lot of people and they were just like you know what I'm not that convinced and I know Alyssa yeah, no, you were getting I mean, some comments yeah I, I'm getting a lot of comments on politically preposterous that I'm going to get to in just a second I want to give my own comment first which is I'm personally very torn on this issue because on one hand and, and putting aside my own politics and generally being in favor of unions on one hand I think there is a good argument to be made that you know they get to go to school and get an education and get room and board and they get a stipend and and etc cetera, etc cetera, and also that they get opportunity right. to potentially become a professional athlete and make a a lot a lot of money um on the other hand if if students are really going to bed hungry i know you said you thought that that was you know exaggerating or exaggeration but if students really are the other thing that we have to remember is some of these people say it's voluntary and and i think to a certain extent it is but if you come from a low-income neighborhood this comes back to the other things we've talked about it about income inequality but if you come from a low-income neighborhood and this is your opportunity and this is your way out it's less so voluntary you you know because you I don't want to mm -hmm. say you're forced into it, but you're more likely to do it because you want to have these opportunities to, to succeed. But also, you know, maybe at not all schools that they're not getting a stipend, that they're going hungry. But if there's some schools where it may be happening. And so the issue is, do we need unions across the board to address that? Or do we need to just target these schools where students are student athletes are going to bed hungry and just say, well, you need to provide better stipends. You need to do it like these other schools where student athletes are not going to bed hungry. Now, on that note, I'm getting the same type of comments. Um, I know that Mr. McHale is probably listening. So if he is, he says that he has a problem with people um, complaining. We'll use the word complaining because we can't say what he said on the radio um, about free a uh, free room and board and a stipend, not to mention the doors that are opened uh, to them in the future. He says, if they don't like it, then we should give these scholarships to someone else and they can go get a regular minimum wage job at a place like Walmart. On the other hand, we have somebody like this, uh, another gentleman named Michael. He said, well, it'd be, it would be more honest if they were treated as employees. So many athletes go to college and they get a useless degree as a false front for playing a sport. Effectively, they are already professional athletes and they're a source of revenue for the schools. Making that open and uh, making it open up and allowing them to unit unionized might actually be healthier and beneficial in the long run so i definitely you know like i said for myself i'm still torn i think there are two sides of the coin on this issue i don't necessarily know if unionization is the answer on the other hand i definitely think that if you have students that are going to bed hungry at some schools then we have an issue uh, that we need to talk about especially when the ncaa is making billions of dollars and the coaches and schools are as well yeah i want to bring it back to jazz and Audrey. so jazz i saw you had your hand raised go ahead I, I think the I think the the key issue here is is the is the NCAA's lack of modernizing these rules. Yeah. The fact that you know I, I mentioned off air, Jameis Winston, uh, quarterback for for Florida State University, they won the 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 football championship this year in college. Uh, many people projected if he was able to enter the the NFL draft, he would be uh, a top five pick, if not the top pick in the draft. But because of the NCAA rules when it w and NFL's rules, he has to play two more years of college, uh, mm -hmm. which which doesn't make sense in a capitalist society that we live in. If you can earn income doing something, uh, why are you forced uh, to be an amateur? 
and 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 obviously that's that's a a rare example but there are plenty of examples out there like that even between college basketball and 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 football football you have to play three years at college uh basketball you you have to be one year removed from high school one and done Uh, but they are they are trying to change that rule adam silver the new commissioner of the nba has discussed extending that period that you have to be removed from high school from one to two years so the notion of one and done would be would be gone it would be two and done uh there's you know as as everyone has said this is a a very complex issue but the 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 biggest uh problem is the fact that the ncaa has not uh, modernized, uh, uh, they're they're dealing with with uh, student athletes. Uh, it's it's like it's still you know the 1960s in terms of how much money they can make outside of uh, their stipends, outside of their scholarships. So I think that's that's the key. And if the NCAA does not get it together, it may cease to exist. Right, Andre, could you chime in on that? Yeah, so really good points raised, and, and as Jess says, really complex issues. I want to bring up two points that, that I think are really important. You know, for those people that say, you know, they get a scholarship, they, they get a stipend, they get a degree, that should be good enough. One of the things that I want to be clear about, and this is another pet issue of mine, is that in particularly uh, in, in the football context, we have these young men that are, that are literally ruining their bodies. They are putting their, their brains and their bodies uh, at risk to participate in this sport. I realize it's voluntary, but the latest brain trauma research indicates that these young college kids are just getting their brains battered in ways that'll infect, that will impact their lives going forward. And we don't need to, to think very hard about this before we start thinking about Junior Seau and Dave Dorson and the real sort of emerging brain research that indicates that these young men are literally um, scrambling their brains and playing tackle football uh, it, you know, in an effort to, 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 you know, perform for a school, make money for a university, and, the, and, and basketball is similar. The other sort of radical point that I want to bring up from a critical race perspective, not many people think about this, but I'd like to put it on the table, is that if you think about the revenue-generating sports, men's football and uh, both men's and women's basketball, Primarily, those sports are played. Majority athletes, uh, the, the majority of the athletes who play those sports are African American, and most people don't realize that the revenue generating sports um, basically fund the athletic departments for all of the other university sports: golf, tennis, swimming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in a lot of ways, if you think about it, African American athletes in football and basketball are generating the revenue that allows all of the other athletes to play their sports. And most of those sports are not played by African American athletes. So we have a situation where African American athletes are earning the money for athletic departments that allow all of the uh, white athletes to play their sports, golf, tennis, swimming, etc., in a way that some people suggest might be exploitative of the African American athletes. So those are two issues that we need to think about when we discuss whether it makes sense for these college athletes to be compensated. Again, it's a really complex issue, but at the end of the day, these athletes are literally breaking their bodies to play these sports and are receiving no compensation, no workman's compensation, no future insurance or benefits for the injuries that they receive to their bodies. And we have to really look at, you know, I agree with the point that we're not talking about curing cancer, we're not talking about science and mathematics, we're just talking about sports. But at the end of the the day, these sports are generating billions of dollars of money, which makes it so important that we figure these issues out now and figure out whether it makes sense to compensate these athletes that break their bodies to play these sports. Andre, I was with you until you offended me. I was a captain of my college swimming team, okay? And let oh, me man, tell my, you my something. Bad. I should have done my research. I apologize. <laughs> I raised seven and a half dollars for my school's <laughs> athletic fund, all right? You should know that. That is very important. But that's a very, inter- very important and interesting topic you made. And also, when these college athletes, when they win a championship... Um, college football, college basketball, it raises the credibility and the reputation of a college as well. It brings it up a yep. tier. Right. And, Jazz, yep. did you want to chime in really quickly on that? Well, oh, well, your, your, is your microphone on? 
I just think that there's an interesting, I mean, maybe you can speak on this more, but ha- it, it got mentioned briefly about how this would affect women athletes. Right. You know, mm-hmm. because women athletes don't generally bring in as much revenue or the revenue stream that male athletes do, and how mm-hmm. the interplay of allowing this NLRB ruling, which is going to be appealed, I think it already is being mm-hmm. appealed, and yeah. ultimately I think is an issue, is an, a really interesting issue of constitutional law um, and just law in general that I think may, in fact, make it to the Supreme Court uh, because it's going to raise issues of freedom of association and other First Amendment uh, rights issues. But how does this really interplay with the Title IX legislation and the and the the ruling? If you could just flesh that out a little bit more, I'd be really interested to hear about that. Well, so we're we're years away from a resolution to this issue, honestly, because if it goes to the NLRB uh, main board in Washington D.C., they may reverse the decision or they may approve it. Northwestern will then certainly file a lawsuit in federal court. It takes years for federal courts to figure these things out. If it goes all the way to the United States Supreme Court to decide whether or not student athletes are actually employees, we could be six, seven years away from knowing what the outcome of this case is, and it would likely be that the, that the, that the student athletes are enjoined from unionizing now. So it could be five, six years before we even see whether these players can collectively bargain. So excellent point there. As far as Title IX is concerned, Title IX requires equal opportunity for female athletes in athletics across the board. If there's anything unequal that comes out of this unionization business, if it's just men's college football players that can unionize, then certainly a Title IX lawsuit would be filed where it would be found um, that Title IX was violated by allowing only men's athlete, uh, men athletes to unionize. And then uh, I- I'm sure the outcome there would be that female athletes could unionize as well and begin to collectively bargain as well. So the outcome on that front would be that if, this, if female athletes are not allowed to unionize as men athletes are, that would be struck down, and Title IX would allow female athletes to unionize, and then they would also be given the right to collectively bargain, form unions, have the terms of their employment, um, you know, specified through collective bargaining. Um, you know, and, and again, we're only talking about at private universities. We're still not talking about what's going to happen with the public university athletes. And so, again, we're in this morass of confusion as to how it's ultimately going to impact all student-athletes across the country. Thank you for that, Andre. So we are actually out of time now. If you could just please let the listeners know where they can get more information from you or if they can reach out if you have any articles. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to anybody by email at Cummings at indianatech.edu. That's the best way to get me, Cummings at indianatech.edu. Um, I just wrote an article on Junior Seau and his uh, suicide in connection with concussion and the NFL's problem and NCAA's problem on that front. And then uh, thanks, guys, for mentioning my book, Reversing Field, available on Amazon.com. Thank you so much for calling in today. It was a great conversation. So, guys, we had to wrap this up. We had the um, rant coming up. But before we do, I just wanted to make... Let um, Jess... Let um, get, you know, let I, I some listeners. Oh, I'm sorry, Stanley. I'm sorry. So, I didn't mean to cut you off like yeah, that. Yeah, I was. I want to give Jazz a second to give his like just l- quick thoughts and like how people can keep up with you. Absolutely, sure. You can uh, you can follow my my site uh, razzandjazzsports.com. That's r a z z a n d j a z z sports.com. Uh, I have a weekly com- column that appears in the New York beacon uh sports section uh you can follow me on twitter i love to engage in intelligent uh uh, dialogue at raz jazz sports thank you so much for that jazz so let's at raz jazz sports support this guy good guy follow him on twitter too we got to wrap this up guys i've had a long monologue closing statement i'm going to keep it very simple quick story from chris weber when um michigan lost the championship the second year in a row he was talking to a reporter he says can i borrow five dollars the reporter says no he sees a kid walk by and a jersey with his name on there and he goes i'm the best player in college basketball and i can't afford to put five dollars of gas in my car and um at that point, 
um, the reporter says that's when you knew that Chris Webber was going to go to the pros. When you create a system in which you benefit with everything and the people who are carrying it on their back benefit from nothing, it's only a matter of time before they will take your wall down. And I feel like that's what's happening in college sports. John Calipari, the coach for the University of Kentucky, ha- um, had some pretty good suggestions. He said that every college athlete should get a three to $5,000 stipend. They should get two plane trips a semester for free to fly back home. They should also get some money put in the fund for themselves and be covered for health insurance fully funded that they do not have to pay back. He proposed to the NCAA. They laughed him out of the room. Then this is the industry we're talking about, and they're making these people billions of dollars a year, billions of dollars a year, and this is why I really believe that they should have a chance to unionize. But anyways, guys, we got to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we will be doing Alyssa and the rant. Well, we won't be doing Alyssa, but Alyssa will be doing the rant. You know, I just wanted before you go to cut out and to break. You know, it it falls back into that tax thing because the NCAA is tax exempt, so it it's just coming full circle to our first segment. Yes. All right. Now I don't know what life would be in H-I-P, H-O-P, without the boy H-O-V. Not only NYC, I'm hip-hop savior, so after this flow, you might owe me a favor. When Kingdom come, you ready? When Kingdom come, I'm ready. When Kingdom come, I'm ready. Now everywhere I go, they like hold me back. About the corner office, I just cold the sack. And we are back. Is that the new Jay-Z? That's an old Jay-Z, actually. That's that came Jay-Z. out in 2006. Kingdom Would, Come. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just not one of the more popular tracks. Was it from a black album? No, no. Kingdom Come. Okay, no, it's from Kingdom Come. Oh, yeah, which you. wasn't really a popular album. That was a great album, though, if you listen to it. I didn't say it wasn't a great no, 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 album. Just I said like it wasn't popular commenting. compared to, like, the Blueprint and yes, the yes, Black yes. Album. Okay, enough about Jay-Z. Yes. We could do a whole segment on that. So, um, I'm here with a quickie slash rant. I'm going to talk about the equal, I'm sorry, the Paycheck Fairness Act. Uh, I want to give you some background about, you know, how we got to this point, and then I'll tell you what the Paycheck Fairness Act is, and ultimately complain about how the Republican Party essentially blocked it. Uh, every single member of the Republican Party voted against the, Repu- the Paycheck Fairness Act. Uh, so, let's talk about some background. So, Um, This Tuesday was what's called Equal Pay Day, and it's essentially the day of which a woman would have to work until in the next year to make the amount of money that, on average, a man makes in one year. So if you look at the fiscal calendar from January 1st, the first quarter, until December 31st, which is the close of the fourth quarter, and you say a man makes X, in order for a woman to make X, she now needs to work through April of the f- the whole first quarter of the next year in order to make X. So that is the argument. And there's some statistics about how, in general, women make about 70 cents, 77 cents on the dollar for every dollar a man makes. Now, there are some definite arguments and disputes and disagreements about why this occurs. And there are some real numbers out there to show that, generally speaking, women take jobs that pay less. And there's also a good amount of information out there that, at, in most jobs where women and men are doing the same thing, they do, in fact, get paid the same amount, which goes back to a 1963 law, which guaranteed, equal, you know, pay equality between women and men who do the same amount of work in the same type of job. However, just because the law says that's supposed to happen doesn't mean that actually happens. And so what we had was a situation where this woman, Lily Ledbetter, she found out that for the same job, she was working the same hours, the, doing the same productivity, and she was getting paid less than her male counterpart. She then went and brought a lawsuit, and the Supreme Court ruled back in 2008, I believe it was, that she was time-barred from bringing that lawsuit because she would have because of a statute of limitations issue. So, in 2009, the first piece of legislation that the president signed into law as the president was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. What that did was it overruled the court's decision, and it allowed women who find out that they were getting paid less than their male counterparts to be able to bring a lawsuit. However, many women and many Democrats said this law didn't go far enough, so they came up with another law called the Paycheck Fairness Act. It would require employers to disclose payment information to the Federal Commission, which is the EEOC, and it would prevent employees from being punished for inquiring with their coworkers about their pay, and it would make employers liable to civil suits where there's alleged pay discrimination. So, for example, right now, if Stanley and I are talking and we work together and we do the same job and I ask Stanley how much money he makes and he tells me, and then I use that information to sue my employer, Stanley can be fired, potentially, for 
giving me that information about how much money he gets paid. What this act would do, which would it pre- would prevent Stanley from being fired for giving me that information. And so it creates this issue where women don't know they're getting paid less because nobody wants to t- tell them. Now, Republicans, of course, say, well, this law would increase litigation. And you know what? To a certain extent, they're right. But sometimes increased litigation isn't a bad thing. Now, obviously, I'm biased because I'm an attorney. And so it, when I hear increased litigation, <laughs> to a certain extent, I say, well, that's some dollar signs. Ching, ching. Ching, ching. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But why shouldn't women be able to bring these litigations? Why, you know, if, if roles were reversed and a man found out that he was getting paid, and this doesn't apply to men. I mean, right, it's Paycheck Fairness Act, so it seems to apply to women. But what happens if a man finds out he's getting paid less than his female counterpart in a job? So it works both ways. It's not just about women. It's about equity. And yes, there is always going to be a pay gap between men and women. Why? Because there is some truth behind the fact that women generally take jobs that pay less. However, when a woman is woman is working in a job that she's doing the same thing as a man, there's no reason why she should be getting paid less whatsoever. And there's no reason why she should not be able to bring a lawsuit later on. So I think this is a ridiculous partisan issue. Um, you know, I, I, the, the, the Republicans always want to bring up these things. They say, oh, pay equity. It's already the law. They say that we're, uh, we're, as Democrats are not focusing on jobs, that we are only trying to bring in this wedge issue right before the election. But the fact of the matter is, this is a real issue. This is a real issue. You really have women out there who cannot get the information that they need. They cannot bring a lawsuit even under the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act because they don't know they're being paid less. And the fact of the matter is, if we want them to be able to find out that they're being paid less, then they need the ability to talk to their coworkers and find out what their male counterparts who do the same thing as them are making. Do Republicans not have women constituents? Are they uh, not listening to their voices? I actually think there are some fair doing? arguments um, for not wanting to pass the bill. Like, for example, maybe you do you do the same job, but you have a higher like potential to earn or to be like a, a, have a position of leadership in the company. And because they know that, and because maybe you had better offers, they gave you a little bump. And there's another there's another nuance to this as well. What about disparities in qualification and seniority and actual responsibilities of work? Is this resultant of actual uh, inequity in the institution themselves or as was earlier alluded to inequity in the opportunities and educational qualifications well, it's a lot of different things going on you know yeah. and I think the response to that is this is, is that that is something that needs to play out in the lawsuit if it turns out that the woman is making less than the man because of X Y and Z then let them go to court let the two attorneys put on the evidence and let the court make a decision like you know what okay you weren't getting paid less because you were a woman the, company, like a didn't do, the company didn't do anything wrong you weren't getting paid less but the fact of the matter is you can't bring this law I mean well yeah now you can bring this lawsuit under Lily Ledbetter but if you don't know the f- you know Lily Ledbetter only goes so far because if you don't know that the man is making more than you then you're not going to be able to know that you should go bring this lawsuit and if it turns out that the reason you're getting paid less is for a perfectly good reason that has nothing to do with your gender then that's exactly what litigation is about. It's about two sides getting to put forth their facts and a jury getting to decide who is correct. Why don't we do that without having to go to a lawsuit first? Why don't we? Well, let, we ha- we're out of time, guys. I'm sorry. We can talk about this off air. I, ha- I have a question about it. Um, well, I, I mean, feel bad for you guys. What would your proposal be? Well, uh, if the, it we don't, wasn't we don't have the time lawsuit. for that right now. But guys, I know this is a big, pretty interesting conversation. If you want to find out where we go from here, call us in the cell phone number. It's 917. <laughs> no, I'm Stop. kidding. But guys, we'll be back next week with another exciting episode of Let Your Voice Be Heard. Will it be Jesus' birthday? Yes, is next it week will. Easter? It no, it's is. Easter. That's not his oh, birthday. Then we it's not, that we may Oh, my God, 420. We may not be here. I don't know what's happening yet with the base gods. Um, guys, thank you for tuning in. We love you. Stay classy.
Canales Latinas es música, alegría, entretenimiento, farándula, deportes, noticias, comentarios y, 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 y mucho, mucho más. Praise the everybody. This is D. 